Uh, good afternoon or good morning. I'm not sure what time of day it is for this. Uh, I'm John Kuhn, um, and uh, I'm at the uh, Naval War College this year as the uh, as the Ernest King Professor, and I want to talk today about oceanic choke points. Um, and this is going to be focused uh, on a lot of geography. So I, I know my audience here, a lot of this geography is going to be very familiar. Uh, and if it's not, well, that's good too, because uh, it, it's geography that's very, very important. Um, and that's the way my discussion is going to go today, is going to focus really from a national security and particularly a maritime security perspective on oceanic choke points and why they're so important in the world today, particularly uh, from from the perspective of guys like me who teach at uh, the National, the Naval, and the Service Academies. Well, if, if you don't recognize this picture, if you haven't figured out what it is, it's me on an aircraft carrier in the Suez Canal, uh, and that's Egypt behind me. So I'm going south through the Suez Canal uh, into the Red Sea. Um, and, uh, and this is one of the major choke points in the world. I thought it'd be a good way to kick things off. Um, the prime mover on the oceans uh, is this thing. This is the, uh, this is the large container ship. Uh, uh, several uh, decades ago, there was something that we in the, in the maritime services called the container revolution, uh, which revolutionized the way uh, merchant ships were loaded uh, to move bulk goods uh, across the oceans. And, uh, um, uh, the, the only other uh, ship uh, that, that we need to discuss here would be the large petroleum tanker, and they're of a similar size. But we started getting the size of ships that were the same size of that aircraft carrier that I was on in the Suez Canal. And, and this is a, a standard container ship. Uh, the connectivity is provided by the container. The containers are lifted off of uh, in ports uh, uh, off of the ships onto rail or, or trucking uh, movers or, or, uh, or movement uh, facilities. And then they move around on the land, uh, either on trucks, on big semi-trucks or on, on trains. Um, the, uh, the Hyundai uh, Merchant Marine is, uh, is, is an example of the, at the forefront of this. This is a Korean shipbuilding concern. And they now have one of these ships that can, can handle 24,000, uh, TEUs. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a that's a uh, shorthand for a container. It's a uh, a twenty foot uh, ex, uh, unit that can be moved around. So that's the standard size is twenty feet, and that's twenty feet long um, for the container. So I just wanted to kind of show you what why the choke points are so important. It's really because of ships like this. Well, this is just sort of a one one over the world wave kind of look at the key choke points in the world um, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, the Panama Canal. But then uh, over uh, in Europe, uh, in the Middle East, and in Asia, uh, we have the, the major uh, choke points. And I'll go through all, all of them as we go along, but these are, these are the major choke points. I'm going to kind of put the bottom line up front here, why they're so important. First, energy. Moving natural gas and moving uh, uh, petroleum, uh, usually as bulk fuel, crude, bulk crude, but sometimes uh, uh, um, uh, gasoline, uh, uh, refined products, refined petroleum products. This shows you what's going on with that. And as you can see, they all the petroleum in the world uh, has to move when it goes on the oceans through these choke points. It's very rare that a, that a large oil tanker is going to uh, move from where it's unloaded bulk oil, say in the Persian Gulf, uh, and not have to go through uh, one of these choke points. Uh, uh, principally, the two major ones in the world today are the Strait of Hormuz, which uh, connects the Persian Gulf to the Indian Ocean, and then the Strait of Malacca, which connects the Indian Ocean to Asia. Well, going back to that giant uh, uh, tanker with the containers on it, the other key thing is food. Um, if it were not for these gigantic container ships and the oceans, we would have a real problem feeding the world. Again, uh, the, uh, the biggest problem is moving the food and the choke points for the movement of that food are these oceanic choke points. I, I love this slide. Uh, this is uh, from the Chatham Maritime House Analysis Tool. 
And as you can see here, it shows you the growth in the movement of food through these. Uh, the light colored uh, circles are uh, for 2020 and then the, the darker colored expansion uh, of the circumferences of these circles for the bulk amount of food that's being moved is uh, in millions of tons, as you can see, is, uh, is uh, just in the 15 years. And as you can see, the bulk of the food that's moving in the world is moving primarily through four, four of the choke points that we're going to talk about. Okay, so it's not just oil, it's food. Um, and then there's the geopolitical consequence. This is from a, a 2010 slide deck that uh, the Navy developed about where the key uh, uh, areas of, uh, of, uh, of, of instability are in the world. And you'll note uh, uh, just about all of them are right in the region of a major choke point. Um, even the, even uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Gulf of Guinea and the African instability region and the instability region in, in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere in South America, which today we would associate with uh, Venezuela, are those are near major oceanic choke points. But most of the major uh, areas of instability, not on here, uh, uh, I would say that that's missing on here is the current instability uh, that exists uh, in the Black Sea, Caspian Sea areas in Azerbaijan and, uh, and uh, Armenia that's going on right now. Uh, I want to kind of drill down uh, for uh, for the United States Navy, and as you can see, the way I like the way this this graphic is laid out because it kind of shows you that essentially the United States Navy's deployment plan is structured on where these choke points are. Wherever wherever these major choke points are, you're going to probably find U.S. and NATO naval forces, and you'll probably also find uh, Chinese naval forces for some of these, not all of them. But certainly on a global basis, you're going to find uh, naval forces, oftentimes major naval forces uh, in these things. All right, I'm going to go through the choke points by region. We've kind of looked at uh, why they're important. We've looked at why they're important from the perspective of, of national security, instability, global insecurity, and also from the point of view of kind of where the United States puts its major naval forces uh, with respect to these and now we're going to kind of go through the Western Hemisphere, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and the Arctic. I have to apologize. My dog is in my office with me, and you might hear him kind of whining a little bit in the background. I apologize for that in advance, but I don't want to get up from the desk and let him out. All right, the Western Hemisphere, uh, what we're really talking about is the Panama Canal in the lower part of, of the screen. Uh, but believe it or not, it's not it's not the most important. I wouldn't even put the Panama Canal in the top 10. But it will become more important for a variety of reasons. The first is the energy independence of the United States. It already is of major importance in terms of uh, transshipment between the Atlantic and the Pacific for, for food. But for oil, it will only become more important. And the food, uh, the food uh, issue will only become more important. But that's not the only straight in the Caribbean that, that we have to worry about. Uh, if you ever wonder why uh, Cuba is so important and why it might be a good idea to have good relationship with Cuba, uh, the, uh, the major uh, thoroughfares out of the Gulf of Mexico from the major American refineries and oil fields, uh, once we start to become a major uh, exporter of foreign oil again, is going, to be, uh, is going to be through the Cuban Strait, which is between Florida and, and uh, Cuba, and the Yucatan Strait over here. There are also some other uh, choke points in the Windward Passage, et cetera, but these aren't nearly as important uh, based on geopolitics. So those are key influential choke points that uh, have great meaning and importance, uh, at least uh, for American national security. From a global standpoint, Northeast Asia is very important. I'm gonna deal with the top of this chart in a, in a chart on the Arctic at the end, uh, but we don't often think about the impact of uh, choke points on Russia and China. Um, uh, for Russia, her access uh, to the sea, it looks pretty wide open from this picture, but actually she, uh, most of that northern part of the, of the, uh, of the slide here, the geography there, is, suffers from weather effects. Now, global warming may change that, but you still have to have the infrastructure that moves across Russia to move container, container shipping, to uh, ports, of ex in, uh, ports of exit 
And, and there really isn't any infrastructure really heavily developed right now. So for Russia, the major choke points in this region are the Tatar Straits that separates Sock Island from uh, the Russian Federation, the La Peru Straits, which uh, are between Sock Island and northern Hokkaido. Uh, there's also the Sugaru Strait and the Shimonoseki Strait, which go through Japanese coastal waters and which Japan absolutely controls. So Russia doesn't have many options. And then finally, there's the exit of the Sea of Japan, the Tsushima Strait, or the Korea Strait, as it's called sometime, which is probably one of the most important straits in the world because of Korea. Uh, Korea is, is one of the major shipbuilders in the world, and she's a major super port and hub, hub, particularly at Busan or Busan in South Korea. So that's a major hub through which uh, Russian goods can go, and it's a major strait that controls uh, the flow of food and oil and material goods uh, for Japan, China, and the Koreas. So that's Northeast Asia. And those are the major choke points there. Uh, for Mid-Asia, uh, we'll kind of start back up at the Korea Strait again, or the Tsushima Strait. But we see that it's a little bit more wide open. But for China, uh, these island chains, particularly the Ryukus and the Senkaku Islands. So if you've heard all this stuff about the Senkakus, aside from the fact that there's probably... Uh, gas fields and resources on the seabeds down there, uh, Japan essentially controls uh, access through that. And then there's the all-important Taiwan Strait, which uh, now you know why China would like to reincorporate Taiwan into its metropolitan polity, uh, because Taiwan actually controls the flow of goods and services through that strait as well. So those are, those are the major straits. Sort of bookended by Tsushima in the north, and the Taiwan Strait in the south with Japan and what uh, the Chinese call the first island chain controlling access here in mid-Asia. And again, major, major thoroughfares for oceanic traffic. Just to kind of hammer the point home for just a second, you know, the bulk of international trade moves on the oceans of the world and the bulk of food and certainly the bulk of energy uh, are moving uh, via the oceanic trade routes through these maritime choke points. Um, I, I wanted to show this, sorry about the, the fuzziness, but this shows you major U.S.-Japanese bases in relation to all of these major choke points. So it's not just the Japanese that have major uh, influencers in terms of uh, military power or diplomatic power backed by military power, it's the United States. So there's this entire basing system in these islands and in Japan, which also causes concern for, for folks uh, that, that may be worried about the United States influencing flow of maritime traffic through these straits. Southeast Asia, uh, probably the most important strait in the world for China uh, is, is the uh, uh, Strait of Malacca up in the, uh, the, uh, uh, the left-hand side of the slide there between Malaysia and Indonesia. It's probably the most important uh, choke point in the world for, if from the aspect of China and also for Japan. The bulk of uh, maritime traffic goes through there. But if that strait was to have problems, if, uh, for example, it was to be closed down or blockaded or there was a major environmental or eco-accident in the Strait of Malacca, these straits in the south become extremely important. And the two that sort of frame uh, the island of Java, the Lombok Strait and the Sunda Strait are probably the, the, the second two most important straits leading into and out of the South China Sea. I kind of missed the northern part of the South China Sea. Let me see if I've got another slide that shows that. Yeah, this will show you that. This shows you the northern part of the South China Sea. And, the, and from the Taiwan Strait next to that is also the Luzon Strait, sometimes called the Philippine Strait. Again, a major traffic area. And again, if the Taiwan Strait gets closed because of, uh, because of uh, problems, geopolitical problems between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China, the Luzon Strait only becomes more and more important. There are also a number of important straits that go through the Philippines. Uh, but right now, the major thoroughfare goes right through the South China Sea. Well, now we move to the most important strait in the world. This is the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, and, and it's the most important strait of the world because of oil. Uh, the, uh, the movement of, of, of uh, fuel oil 
from fuel oil tankers in and out of the of the, of the Persian Gulf um, is one of those things. It's it's cheaper to do it. If you ever wonder why is it why why on ships why not on railroads? It's just so much cheaper uh, to use ships to move bulk goods than to move bulk goods on railroads or uh, via trucking. And you need all that infrastructure and it's subject to all these political constraints. Where on the oceans, uh, you can move these things on what Mahan called, a, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan, the famous sea power theorist from the United States called the global commons. And the Strait of Hormuz, if we went back to our petrodollars thing, you'd, you'd see 19 billion barrels of oil moving through there. And that was back in 2015. Um, and if you've ever wondered that why the United States uh, uh, maintains such a heavy presence in the Middle East, that's why. Now, with the United States energy independence, that choke point is perhaps less important to Americans than it was, say, uh, 50, 40, 50 years ago uh, when the United States uh, 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 imported so much of its oil. But it's still the most important choke point in the world for energy uh, uh, exports for the rest of the world, particularly for China, particularly for China. It's also important for Japan and for Europe, although there are gas, uh, natural gas lines and oil pipelines uh, that, are, that are sort of trying to solve the problem, but they'll never completely solve the problem. So the Strait of Hormuz, and as you can see, it's controlled, uh, it's an international waterway, but, uh, but it can easily be shut down and was shut down uh, during the Iraq-Iran war in the 1980s. Uh, which caused the United States to actually escort tankers through uh, the strait uh, in, in a period 1987-1988. Uh, the other critical uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, choke points are the are the Panama or the uh, Suez Canal, which I'll get to, but the Bab el Mandeb. So the uh, the Strait of Hormuz is up here, but as that traffic that's coming to the West to bring goods and services, primarily oil, to uh, other countries in the Middle East and Africa, as well as to uh, uh, Europe, European customers, it has to go through the Bab el Mandeb Strait. This is why the, the problems in Yemen is such a huge problem of so much concern to Americans and to Europeans is because of uh, the oil that moves through uh, the Bab el Mandeb Strait, which, which is here separating Africa and the, uh, and the Arabian Peninsula. Um, it is also something of a choke point over here in the entrance to the Gulf of Aden, but the real choke point is here and then leading into the Red Sea and leading into the Red Sea. Uh, from there, we go to uh, the Suez Canal here in the lower part of the slide. Uh, you can see the Suez Canal uh, controlled by Egypt, uh, a source of incredible revenue for Egypt. But it's also uh, a major, a major strategic choke point, bringing all those goods and services, and not just uh, not just oil, but food as well from other parts of the globe. Uh, for example, uh, uh, food from Australia, uh, uh, sheep, uh, mutton. Uh, so it's incredible the amount of food that's actually coming across the Indian Ocean, coming through the Bab el Mandeb up into the Suez Canal, and then to customers in the Middle East and Europe as well. So there's, that's the Suez Canal. The other key choke point is really two choke points, and they're both controlled by Turkey, a subject of a couple of international treaties. But again, when nations control these straits, uh, their interests will take precedence over treaties if they feel it's, an, it's a circumstance that's important enough. And so for Turkey, the control of the Bosporus uh, up here near Constantinople or Istanbul, and then the Dardanelles, which were a huge hugely important strait in World War I. They actually fought an entire campaign there to try to control those straits to open up uh, the oil coming out of, out of this area, the Caucasus oil fields and the fields in Russia. Uh, so oil and food, also food because uh, of the incredible amount of weed and grain that, that's produced by the countries on the Black Sea. So another major thoroughfare for the movement of goods and services by the sea another major important choke point, um, and another reason, if you've ever asked yourself, well, why is Turkey important? If you don't understand why Turkey is important. The Mediterranean used to have key choke points uh, that, that were very, very important in days past, not as important as they used to be, but they're still important. Uh-oh, I went the wrong way. Let me go there. 
A key among these is uh, Gibraltar. Now, Gibraltar is not on, on the big map, but I've got it down. Uh, it's the exit to the Mediterranean. Again, um, less important than it used to be, but still a major thoroughfare for the movement of goods and services out of the Mediterranean from the Mediterranean commons, as it were, into the Atlantic for the movement of goods and services there. So uh, uh, Gibraltar, again, another major base there at Gibraltar that's uh, controlled by NATO forces, by uh, the United Kingdom, and then Morocco in the south. Um, another strait that yours truly has been through on a, on a number of occasions. I think I've, I think I've actually transited that strait six times in my, in my lifetime. Uh, the Suez Canal, I've actually been through, uh, through five times, and I've been through the Strait of Malacca uh, two times. Well, now we go to north, north, Northwest Europe. The key straits here are, of course, the Danish Straits, the Skagerrak, which provides the, the exit from the Baltic and the entrance to the Baltic to service the Scandinavian and the Baltic countries, as well as Russia. Um, the English Channel, again, it's a major uh, thoroughfare for goods and services moving, moving from, uh, from northeast to southwest. And then uh, from a, a geopolitical standpoint is, are, are these straits here up in the north, what's often been called the GI-UK gap. Uh, and the last time these really played a role in geopolitics was during the Cold War uh, in the confrontation between the Soviet Navy and the NATO navies. Uh, but again, more important, we may see more movement as global climate change uh, uh, um, makes uh, shipping cheaper and cheaper through there on great circle routes uh, that are less ice bound than they used to be. But those are also some major choke points up here, the GI-UK gap as it's known, uh, Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom gap. Not really a choke point in the sense of uh, the English Channel or the Danish Straits. My final slide on, on maritime choke points is this one. Sorry, it's not a better strait. Um, choke points of the future, I've, I've labeled this one, and this one is directly related to the development of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of climate change, where we will see more and more importance uh, become as we can begin to more and more maritime uh, uh, traffic begins to move through the Arctic Ocean uh, to move goods and services through the Arctic, never mind uh, accessing uh, energy and, and natural resources in that part of the globe. Key choke point here is the Bering Strait here between Alaska and the Russian Federation, but also the, the, uh, the access into uh, the White Sea here to the Russian Federation. This was a major, major access point and a choke point because of the ice in World War II where the Lend-Lease convoys uh, provided all of that uh, military Lend-Lease aid to the Soviet Union when they were battling the Germans uh, in World War II. Finally, we may actually see the Northwest Passage become a viable, a much more viable uh, uh, route for maritime traffic if global climate change gets worse. You know, my own hope is that these choke points don't become more important in the future that we can get a handle on global climate change. But then again, we may, you know, we, we may see another ice age in a couple thousand years and that'll solve that problem again. But, but I don't think we'll be around for that. So we have to take global climate change seriously. All right, let me get to my bottom line and wrap things up. Uh, I haven't had the, uh, I haven't had the, my controllers interrupt me yet to say, Hey, you got to end the brief. So here's what the points that I want to make about these choke points. Again, here are the major ones that I talked about, the most important ones in the world, the Turkish Straits, the Danish Straits, Panama Canal, Suez Canal, Bab el Mandeb, Strait of Hormuz, and Strait of Malacca. Uh, th these uh, straits over here in Northeast Asia, very, very important. But again, from an economic and world food situation, uh, the, the ones that are shown on this slide are really, really the most important straits in the world today in terms of feeding the world and keeping the world with the energy that it has right now. So they are the intersection. So the, the oceans of the world, the global highway, they're the cheapest way to get your, uh, your Xboxes, you know, across the oceans to you and your, and your, and your manufactured items that are being manufactured, being manufactured, not in the United States, but in China or Japan or, or Indonesia or the, uh, or India. Um, and the choke points are like the intersections. The navies of the world uh, are, and, and the nations that, that sort of own those navies are sort of the traffic cops of those intersections. 
And so, uh, so the Turks and their military power and diplomatic and national power for the Turkish Straits, the Iranians uh, and the Middle Eastern Gulf states there, um, and then China and the United States and their naval forces and the NATO naval forces that are that are allied to the United States are sort of like the traffic cops of these global choke points. They're all international waterways. They're governed by uh, a host of treaties. The most important one is the UN Convention Law of the Sea Three, which uh, is the which is the treaty which governs the movement through these international waterways of goods and services. Um, and I think it's all in our best interest to try to ensure that they remain free, open, and available so that we can continue to feed the world and to uh, energize the world uh, as we go into the 21st century. But they are also flashpoints, unfortunately, for global instability. And that's all I have. I don't know if I'm supposed to take questions or not, but that uh, completes my, uh, my lecture. And I thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm.